Make this Christmas memorable with Goat Guns. Get the coolest miniature gun models for your collection. From historical classics to modern weapons, we have something for every firearm and hobby enthusiast. Surprise your loved ones with the gift of Goat Guns, the perfect blend of quality and detail. Shop now and spread the joy at GoatGuns.com. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Justin Locke about the principles of applied stupidity. Justin Locke, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Hey, nice to be here. Yeah, it's great to be with you today. I'm super excited to have a nice conversation. We're going to be discussing your recent book, Principles of Applied Stupidity. I love the title, and I'm super excited to unpack this with you and really have a nice conversation. As we get started, I just wanted to share Justin's bio with everybody. Justin Locke spent 18 seasons playing bass with the Boston Pops Orchestra. He has worked with some of the most famous conductors in the world and is the author of Real Men Don't Rehearse, a collection of amusing behind-the-scenes tales of playing in the Boston Pops. Justin's second book, which we will be discussing today, is an unusual look at the management techniques of the best conductors titled Principles of Applied Stupidity. These are essentially somewhat devious and manipulative, but marvelously effective management skills that are very much outside the box. I'm super excited to explore those with you today. Uh, Justin, anything else you would like to share with listeners by way of your background or personal context before we dive on in? Oh, I think that was too much. You know, it'll, it'll all come out in the wash anyway, so let's just go. Okay, cool. So why don't you start by framing up for us a little bit about your time with the Boston Pops, um, how you got into that uh, that career path, and really wh- why are you in this kind of new path where you're applying those experiences into more of a management realm? Oh, wow. Well, that's... That, that... 25 minutes. <laughs> okay. I grew up on a farm and my mother was really into music and she pushed me hard into a music career. And I learned early on that if I wanted any, you know, support or money for outside activities, I had to play the string bass. So I, I went with it and I came to Boston and practiced hard and boy, did I get lucky. Uh, but when I was 20 years old, the phone rang and the most famous orchestra in the world was hiring me to play. At that point, it was one week. But it was such a culture shock to go from a soybean silo. This is no exaggeration. It was a 50-acre dirt farm that we rented out and corn and the whole bit. Here I am on the stage of Symphony Hall, and I am just trying to survive. I'm just trying to cope and not get kicked out the door. And I was just just a sponge. I was this empty head because, you know, when you grow up on a farm, you know, it's like solitary confinement. You don't see anything. So everything was just coming at me as natural. And the first thing I'll say, the first principle of applied stupidity here, I did not know. I was ignorant. So I didn't know that I had no business being there. I, and the thing is three or four years later, when those sometimes was, ignorance is bliss, isn't it? Ignorance is it, this is my premise of my book is that sometimes it's really good to be stupid and ignorant. It, it worked for me big time. And I, I, I walked in and I was just like, okay, Arthur Fiedler's conducting today. And I said, for the purpose, I have to remember the audience. Arthur Fiedler was the most, is the most successful conductor ever still is more tickets sold, more rec- recordings sold everything. And they said, Arthur's conducting today. And I said, Arthur who? Now, normally you'd think that would get me kicked out. What a total ignorant guy. But everybody laughed. 
Yeah, Arthur who? That's the attitude to have. Everybody thought I was funny. They thought I was making a joke. And I just I just clammed up. Or, you know, don't don't say anything, Justin. You did a good thing, but you figured it out later. And I guess to 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 jump into it, years after this, I mean, I I, I spent 18 years freelancing, you know, which is a very tenuous existence, but I managed to do it and pay my rent by honking out notes on a string base. But then I got started to thinking about Arthur Fiedler. This is really the cognitive dissonance. This is where it all started. So I'm looking at this guy. He's not very good looking. Can't sing. Can't dance. Can't compose. Uh, is, has this ugly voice. Like this. And this is the most successful conductor in the world? Shouldn't he be gorgeous with a fabulous... He wore a red blazer, something you'd see at a you know, that they would give you at a, a fancy restaurant in case you didn't have your own jacket. That's what he wore. And it was just, he didn't even wear a bow tie. And, and could, I just couldn't square in my head, how is it that someone who is this, uh, this mediocre, this unusual, this untalented, how is he so successful? And this dogged me for decades, really. I just, how does this be? Because I kind of, at one point, I wanted to be a conductor. I since learned that you don't want to be a conductor, but. I was like trying to emulate this guy, and I, but it made no sense in the context of everything I'd been taught up to that point. That's excellent. And that kind of a, a transition from farm boy to Boston pops and kind of being an in over your head, but not knowing any different. I, I, I think that's wonderful. And, you know, frankly, we all find ourselves in those types of situations um, within our own, the bounds of our own context. But it, you know, it's, it's one reason why so many people struggle with imposter syndrome. So many people talk about this idea of fake till you make it. You just kind of, sometimes you don't know what you don't know and you just go and you just do your best and you try to survive and you figure it out. And, and then you see examples around you and hopefully you have good examples that you can try to emulate, that you can try to pattern yourself and your career after to, to find success. And it sounds like that's exactly what you did. And like, you know, I appreciate you acknowledging that, you know, not only did you have a tremendous amount of skill, clearly you did because they, they hired you um, to work with a famous orchestra and you had a successful freelance career for decades um, but also acknowledging that there's a good amount of just um, serendipity and and fate and luck, however you want to call it, into how we go about uh, establishing our own careers and the work that we do. Um, and so as, as we move forward, let's start to talk about some of the, the aspects. You, you talk about this most famous conductor who, on the face of it, you know, looks, voice, all these things, you would never guess um, that they would be the most famous conductor in the world, yet they are. So what were some of those types of competencies that, that he had that allowed or, or, him or to... incompetencies. <laughs> or incompetencies that allowed him to be so successful? Well, I'm going to sidestep just a little bit. I was, I was researching you, which I shouldn't have done. <laughs> and you published an article last week, I think, about why people should ask more questions. And I read all that, and I was like, oh, this is interesting. Well, we'll make this part of the, the interview. And what I want to I frame the, the context of the book is something I call classroom conditioning. Now, we could spend a lot of time. I've studied. I was fascinated with school, mostly because I hated it. And I didn't hate school because I was an excellent student. I was cum laude. I had 4.0 average, but I still hated school. And if you look at the broader context, and again, the podcast is about managing organizations, you know, and, you know, people skills and that sort of thing. So here's a, a data point, which is there's something that most Americans have in common, no matter who walks through the door to apply for a job at your company or who's running a company or a customer. Compulsory education is kind of a thread that covers just about everybody goes to school. In one way or another, there's, there's different kinds of schools. I went to a poor kid's school and a rich kid's school. They're very different experiences, but they were schools. It's a common thread. And if you back up to the history, and we, we don't have time for this, but it's fascinating to study. There's a book called The 12 Year Sentence, and it's about the history of compulsory education in the United States. Because for a long time, people didn't go to school, and then they were in child labor. And then we said, Why can't they have these kids in the factories? Let's put them in a school. And then when they built the factories, we had all these immigrants coming in who didn't speak English. 
let's put them in a school and make them. This is why I think we still have English classes for people who speak English like natives, (laughs) because we're still teaching English, because it's a holdover from that thing. And so the, the point I'm trying to get to is there's a cultural paradigm in place that we acquire from our school experience, which is that being smart is good and being stupid is bad. So harking back to your article, I wanted to say that one of the reasons people don't ask questions is asking a question is, up, is, is announcing to the world that you don't know the answer. You didn't do the homework. You, you, you cheated it on the test. You, 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 you haven't been doing what you're supposed to do, which is read the assignment and know the answer. But in real life, just kind of an aside, I, I once met a guy who was an, uh, an MBA uh, guy at uh, running a company. And I said, what is unusual about being having an MBA and running companies, what, what you do? And he says, what's the thing that I should know about that? And he says, well, there's a big uh, misunderstanding. He says, we think people with MBAs are smart. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? He says, we're all C students. We're barely making it through, through high school. And yet we're the ones running the companies. And I, of course, said, why is that? And he said, well, being a C student puts you in a position of a cultural, experiential, where you're used to failing. You're used to encountering stuff that you have no idea what's going on. Uh, You have to come up with an answer and somehow pass this test, as opposed to kids who get get eight, you know, four-point averages. They're not used to failing. And this was one of the biggest failures of school for me, was that I was not taught how to deal with failure. Uh, and there's a whole chapter in my book about dis- what is failure? Why do we fear failure? So uh, again, that, that training, that, that training of fear of failure, you know, uh, smart is good and stupid is bad. Most of your employees and people you work with have that training ground into them from age five onwards. There's that, so you will- yeah, and let me, let me say just another way to frame that. And I think about, um, you know, the public school system, for example, as you're describing, it it drives conformity, right? It drives conformity of thought. And so young children are inherently creative and innovative. They they can do make-believe games all day long. And over time, you kind of drum that out of people. And and there are some some individuals who are able to maintain it. you know, I, I think of, of musical and, and artistic types as, as being an example of that, but, but it's, it's really beaten out of a lot of people. And so you then come out of the public school system thinking that you do X, Y is going to happen. And the world is not that simple. It's far more complex than that. No. And we have to learn how to quote unquote fail. And I, you know, I'm just going to flat out say using the term failure is a problem in and of itself what we need to do is just reframe failure as learning, right? That we we go through a process. It doesn't work out the way we think it is going to work out. We learn from it. We adapt, we pivot, we do something new and different. And, and then we're able to find a different outcome that that's the process of learning and developing ourselves. And in, in some ways we undermine that with the way education works or the way we do training and development Un- programs with corporations. A very polite word. <laughs> I'm excited to announce the publication of my new book from HCI Press, Bluer Than Indigo Leadership, The Journey of Becoming a Truly Remarkable Leader. Early in my adult life, I learned about an Asian proverb that translates as bluer than indigo. If you think about the color indigo, it is a brilliant, deep, and vibrant blue. What some would call the bluest of blues. To have something that is bluer than indigo is rare and truly remarkable. Contrary to popular myth, there is no one-size-fits-all or cookie-cutter approach to effective leadership. There's no silver bullet, no secret sauce, no go-to model that will solve all of our problems. The truth is, great leaders have all had their unique strengths and flaws, and have all had to discover and then pave their own distinctive path in their life's journey to fulfill their leadership potential. Bluer Than Indigo Leadership will help you discover your own path 
and explore those ordinary, everyday actions that will help you respond to an uncertain future and produce extraordinary results for individuals, teams, and organizations. Well, I'm going to save you reading one chapter of the book, because this is one of the most important chapters of the book, which is about understanding failure. Failure is created. It doesn't exist in nature. So what you have is what I call a, a, a non-success event. Let's say you, you're coming to one of my lectures and you pull into the parking space and there's, a, you know, there's lines in the parking lot for your car and, and you mistime it and now you're, you're not in the space. You went over the line. Is that a failure? Or is it just a non-success event? The difference is if you have a non-success event and then you add shaming to it, now it's a failure. And that is the, the experience that for little kids, they have no armor for that. They just get this shaming experience for having done something other than what was permitted and taught to them. And that's how you start to, to, to undermine. So I want to skip ahead to another thing in the cat chapter. Now that you have this problem that's embedded in most of the people you're working with and dealing with, how do you overcome that in a very pragmatic, not institutionally, not let's change the schools, let's write a book, let's publish a manifesto. No, you got to get the product out the door today. So what's the way to do this? Well, you got to deal with that shame. And this, and this is the one of the workarounds. You act stupider. If you make a mistake yourself and kind of go, oh, gee. So that gives permission to your, other, your underlings to make a mistake themselves. And I've actually, I've done this to people all the time. I will just do something and just, and if you think about it, you'll know there's somebody somewhere in your past that you worked with who pulled this on you. They did a horrific job on something. They took on a project and they created something and here, here's what I did and it's junk. And you'll look at that and you'll say, well, I couldn't have done that myself, not my thing, but I could certainly do better than that. And at that point, you've given, now you can go to lunch, you know, have, have a cup of coffee, a cigarette, because that person is now has permission and safety to at least, if, if they fail, they can't, they're safe. You see what I'm saying? This, because you acted stupid, you did a lousy job. And that's, that's a quintessential principle of applied stupidity. Uh, I saw conductors do this all the time. The top conductors all did this. There was a guy who was the uh, conductor of uh, Royal Ballet, came to Boston for a big premiere. And we're like, oh, my God, you know, this guy's a top conductor. He comes out and he says, I have a terrible secret to share with you. And who doesn't love a terrible secret? And he said, uh, I'm tone deaf. I mean, we all just laughed. You know, we'd seen this guy. We knew he was, he was, you know, he was a professional guy. But then he said, but you know, we've got ballet dancers up here, so it's important that you play in the right place. He was basically prioritizing and saying, don't, because musicians will get all into, oh, was I a little out of tune? You know, and he didn't care. He wanted the beat there for the dancers to, to be on the beat for the dancers. Don't worry about it. If you're out of tune, who cares? And he made us laugh and made us like him. And we're like, oh, and we all felt like, well, we got to help him out. He's an incompetent guy. We don't want him to get fired. We'll, we'll carry him. We'll, we'll cover for you. As opposed to the conductors that came out and lorded their power over us. And of course, you know, I sabotage those people all the time. I just thought it was justice. Let's just ruin this concert. Because you can't catch a bass player ruining the concert. It just, it's too subtle. But that was just, that's anyway, we're getting back to the, that's a principle of applied stupidity is feigning incompetence. You get these marvelous results from it. And that, this is what I was just so surprised as I, I started to codify all these experiences with people. Uh, so it's that, the self-deprecation, right? People don't like working for an arrogant boss. No, they want to they work don't. for someone who's relatable. And, and what you just described is a, a context where someone is, is, is engendering loyalty and commitment from their people. Right. Yeah. As opposed to someone who uses more fear based tactics and is trying to get compliance with their will. You know, someone with more of a con command control approach who's basically saying, I am the boss. I'm the best. Everyone look to me. Do what I say. Nobody's going to have that person's back. Nobody cares about that person. Nobody they, they might comply because they're fearful, but they're not going to try to uh, really 
put themselves out there for their leader or their boss uh, who they don't have any meaningful connection with. Well, it's, 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 if you're in a position where you have to produce, where you're really in, in a creative realm, which is where I live most of my professional life, uh, you, you have to get buy-in from the people working for you. They have to be excited about it and interested in it. And that's, this is what, you know, like Henry Mancini was a classic guy at this. I mean, I told this story in the book. He, he made what looked, I always thought he made a mistake. I thought it was a huge oversight. I'll tell the story. It, it was, he was guest conducting Pops, and we got to Pink Panther. It was all his stuff, you know, and Two for the Road and Moon River and all that. We get to Pink Panther. Now, who doesn't know Pink Panther? It's easy piece, right? Da-dum, da-dum, dum, da-dum. That's all it is. So he looks at us, and, you know, we're running through the program. And you, you know, it's good to go through a piece that you've never played before. Because there might be a repeat sign that someone forgot to put in, you know, you might get lost. Or you, you, it's just good to go for, make sure before you do it for paying customers. So we get to Pink Panther in the rehearsal, and he says, you all know this, right? And, of course, we also we want to please, sure, sure, we know Pink Panther, a famous piece. He says, great, and he just plunk, turned it over. We didn't play it, didn't even look at it. And we all kind of looked at each other like, uh, well, we know it generally, but we don't know this arrangement specifically but you can't say that to a conductor you just told him you knew it and that's protocol he's in charge so we get to the concert tonight and we're all on stressed we're all on pins and needles we're all worried we're like oh my god we didn't go through what if there's a pitfall what if there's something in there we didn't gee uh, uh, we're all like uh, this is over pink panther it's not over Mahler's third it's not over mozart's 41st pink panther is like this huge deal to us because we didn't rehearse it, which is a mistake. You're not supposed to do that. And we get there, and he, he just gives the downbeat. It was one of the most riveting performances of my entire career. And it wasn't Mozart or Beethoven. It was Pink Panther. And the audience could feel this. The intensity of it was just through the roof. And I always, for years, I thought, well, he, he made a mistake. And isn't, isn't it remarkable? That even though he did something totally wrong, he got a good, excellent result. Now I know. Now I know he did it on purpose. Because if we had rehearsed it, we would just perfunctorily go through it. Because, and he was like, I got to control this. Uh, he says, no, 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 I'm going to put you on the spot. <laughs> and we, and th- the energy level was just, and other conductors, I'll name names, Seiji Ozawa does this, did this. I don't know if he's still conducting. He would, uh, very hard to follow. Very hard to discern, you know, between all this movement and the hair and the beads and, you know, everything. But panic, sheer panic. Where are we? Where is the beat? And you, orchestra playing is really about tuning in to the people around you and matching what they're doing. And you really had to listen because the leadership was not there. And you get these stupendous energy in, in his, his performances. How do you make that line? You know, because but this is the only way I could explain what these guys do. It was completely counter to everything I'd been taught. So that's uh, I, I love it. I love it. And you know, overall, I just again, I love the title. I love the premise: principles of applied stupidity. Again, I mean, it's a kind of a provocative title, but the general idea here is is that those who tend to find more career success are those that don't take themselves so seriously, who don't have this, this arrogance about them, who engender loyalty and commitment from their people, who empower their people to be their best selves, to, 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 to perform at their peak potential, right? Uh, Everything that you just described to me um, that, you know, that's how I'm hearing it. That's how I'm framing it up. And so it's, it, you know, as I hear that, it's no surprise that yes, these people would uh, end up being the best conductors. And I think about the best leaders in organizations, whether it's conducting or 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 coaching a team or oh, man- managing a team of people. It's it's all the similar types of principles. Um, and we don't need to pretend like we have it all figured out. We don't need to pretend like we know everything. We can lean into the messiness and, and the complexity, rely on the expertise of our people, because the conductor. For example, they're not, you know, well, maybe I guess I don't know because I'm not like 
super musical like you are, but I'm guessing the conductor doesn't actually play every single instrument. No. Um, and they, they don't have the technical expertise to know how to, to play a masterpiece they're they're but they're bringing everyone together and and that's the role of the conductor that's the role of the leader it's not to micromanage my people and to try to tell everyone exactly how to do their job it's to empower them to do their job well and and to support them in doing their job well the one point that i would add to that all in agreement is that people are trained to be lousy leaders there's a tremendous amount of of uh figureheads and uh <sighs> paradigms of those other words looking for examples where we say, Oh, this, this is a tough, you know, kick-ass leader. And I ran into this. I had a con- guy walked in and was for whatever reason, he says, we need to get a conductor in here to, to whip this orchestra into shape. That was the phrase he used, which is that idea that the leader has to come in and, and you get those conductors who that, that's their mindset. I'm working against you. I have to beat you to work, you know, and folks, folks, we're not picking cotton here. You got to talk. These people are, you know, have spent their lives studying how to play the oboe. They know every you know, the conductors who knew how to work with me would you know understood that. But I do want to make what I've tried to study and and codify is that the the training that is normal in many school situations is counterproductive. And as a a manager who has to not out of theory, you have to right now. You got to make things go understand that that cultural influence is on the people you're working with at, at numerous levels. And you can, using these principles, you can work around them immediately without them knowing it. They will do what you want because, oh, Justin is such an idiot. Here, give me that. I will fix it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, that's, yeah. that's it. That's it. Yeah. Wonderful. Justin, it has been a real pleasure. I note the time and I need to let you go here in just a moment. But before we close, I wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you, find out more about your book, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Oh, final. Geez. Uh, okay. Well, the easiest thing is just go to my website. It's Justin Lock, L-O-C-K-E, justinlock.com. Uh, it has a lot of stuff, mostly about my, you can link to the books. They're mostly available, you know, online, Amazon, stuff like that. There's a lot of, you can read the first 10 pages that, uh, on Amazon. And that, that, I mean, they're the 800 pound gorilla where you buy books. I don't sell them myself anymore. Uh, and, you know, you can find the links to videos. I do a lot of talks on the books, which are a lot of fun, but, and so that, that's it, justinlock.com. And then the last thing I say is that the, 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 the message I want to say to people is this humility is got a lot of power in it and we're all sinners in the sense that we fall short of our ideals and get in touch with your inner idiot your imperfect the idea of school is that you can achieve a perfect score and i think that's evil it's genuinely evil to say to people that you can achieve perfection it's blasphemous actually not that i'm a religious guy really but i have to use those terms because that's what everybody knows and understands so understand that you are imperfect Embrace that because understanding that you are ignorant, that you don't know the answer, is the beginning. That's the first step to real enlightenment. I love it. I'll stop there. I love it. Thank you, Justin. It has been a real pleasure. I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected, check out his book, find out more about what Justin can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. The Alchemy of Truly Remarkable Leadership. Ordinary, everyday actions that produce extraordinary results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years. With increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition, the average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? 
Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. Check out Human Capital Innovations magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free, interactive e-magazine with the mission to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We publish issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Take a look at the latest issue and let us know what you think. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week. Check out our new weekly LinkedIn newsletter, Alchemizing Human Capital, exploring industry trends via original research and interviews with executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We look forward to having you join us.